response. <laughs> oh, it's either not good or dead. <laughs> uh, how is everyone today? Is it, are you good today? Are you, re- are you excited to worship your Savior? <laughs> All right. Well, I hope so, because that's what we're about to do. So uh, let's go ahead and stand. Um, let's worship Jesus, our Savior. I'm going to start with prayer. Father God, thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you that you show us grace every day. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you that we know one day he will come back. And Father, we know the word refers to him as the lion and the lamb, the lamb that was sacrificed and the lion that will conquer. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's go ahead and sing that song, The Lion and the Lamb.
All right, let us go ahead and sing Man of Sorrows. the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus built. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free. Welcome to Trinity Church. I'm glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us today. Um, not a whole lot by way of announcement. I just want to point your attention to the back of the bulletin. Uh, on the back of the bulletin there, we will have uh, different classes that we're going to have throughout the month of May. Um, and so if you're interested in any of those, I would suggest you taking a look at that uh, and seeing one, what Sunday, what class lies. Um, but other than that, uh, not a whole lot. One thing that you may notice is if you looked in your bulletin and looked at the music, you may have noticed a song that we're about to do that may not be familiar. Now, I hope it's kind of familiar. Maybe you've heard it somewhere before. 
uh, but we've never sung it here at church. Um, but it is, it's an amazing song. Uh, there's a, a group, they're called Chain and Chain, uh, and they've been writing sort of newer versions of the old, and hy old hymns, but also they've been taking psalms and writing songs from those psalms. Um, and I think it's an awesome, awesome way to worship our Savior, right? We're using the Word of God to worship Him. And He calls us to worship in spirit and truth, and what is more true than His own Word? I want to give a little context to this, uh, to this psalm. Many psalms were written by who? David, right? Maybe some of Solomon. But this is a psalm that was actually written by Moses. Now, he wasn't alive during this time, but it was something that they had kept. Uh, and this was a prayer of his. Well, in Psalm 90, what we're going to read through, and a lot of commentators, they believe the context of this prayer of Moses is in Numbers 20. Numbers 20 goes through a whole lot in Moses' life. First thing we see is his sister die. Right? And we also see uh, God commanding him to speak to the rock and water come out, but he instead breaks it and, and strikes the rock. And this causes him not to enter the promised land. We also see in the chapter that his brother dies. See, Moses, he has gone through a lot. And what we see in this, in this chapter, in the book of Psalms, is that uh, he's trusting in God through it all. And even though he knows how bad sin is. And he knows that God has to deal with sin. Right? And he understands, like, man, life is so short. He just saw his brother and sister die. He still cries out to God and says, God, still be my joy. Still satisfy me. Because that is the only place we can find true satisfaction. So I'm going to have the ladies up here. They're going to read Psalm 90 for us. Starting with verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning, in the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let's stand and sing Psalm 90. When the sun comes up, satisfy us Before the day has passed us by Before our hearts forget all your goodness Satisfy us with your love dwelling place O oh, everlasting God Before you formed the mountain tops you were before it all and soon our lives turn back to die 
when the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day has passed us by. Before our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy us with your love. The wrath of God poured out for sin on Jesus crucified. Consider Him our Before the day has passed us by, before our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy us with your love. Teach us, Lord, to number our days on earth and give us more. Wisdom in the secret art as you display amazing grace to Jesus Christ for us. Teach us, Lord, to number our days on earth and give us more. Wisdom in the secret art. Before the day has passed us by, before our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy us with your love. When the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day has passed us by. Father, that is the prayer of our heart, that we would find satisfaction in your love. Father, I pray as we hear from your word now that you would just calm our spirits to be focused solely on you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we not only live between sunrise and sunset, we live between the eternities. And I was laughing when we sang that song earlier and it said, uh, you know, bow down. Hey, I'll be glad when these two replaced knees can bow down one more time and be able to worship God one day in eternity. Today, we're continuing with Revelation. And if you look on the back of your bulletin, you see that we're going to be in Revelation for about three more weeks. We're going to be looking at the eternal state today in Revelation 21. Then we'll be looking at the end of 22, Lord willing, next week. And then we're going to lay out for you for two weeks the absolute chronological floor, uh, flow of the book of Revelation. You'll have it from the very beginning all the way through the end, everything that we've talked about for the last 30 weeks. So I want to really encourage you to get, to get that flow, to get those diagrams, so that you can really have that together as, as complete notes. But today I want to look at the eternal state. You know, a lot of times we, we think of, of heaven, we're going to be on a cloud, or we're going to be running around with wings or harps or whatever. But I want to suggest to you that what we're going to look at is a specific place. It's a specific city. 
that we're going to dwell in. And so we're going to be looking at that in Revelation chapter 21. I want you to turn there. What's it going to be like in eternity? What's the new Jerusalem? What's the new heaven and earth going to be like? We're going to look at the descent of the new Jerusalem. That's going to be the focus of eternity, and that's where we're going to focus. Then we're going to be looking at the description of that new Jerusalem. Then we're going to be looking at six specific delights that are going to be in that city for us to enjoy. Let's go to Revelation 21, and then we'll bow together. I want to read through this whole chapter into chapter 22, verse 5, so that we see the whole flow of what's happening here. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars should have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she also had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 gates at the, uh, the angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the land. And he who talked to me had a, a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. And the city is laid out as a, as a square in its length, as great in its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed. 12,000 furlongs in length, breadth, and height are, are equal. Then he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. That's who was measuring it at the time. And the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardox, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, and the eleventh jason, and the twelfth amethyst and the 12 gates were 12 pearls each individual gate was one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass but I saw a temple in it I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple the city had no need of the sun nor the moon to shine in it for the glory of God illuminated it the Lamb is its light and the nations of those who were saved shall walk in the light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it the gates shall not be shut at all by day. There will be no night there. And they shall bring the glory of the honor of all the nations into it. But there shall be no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there was no more curse. 
but the throne of God and his Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light, or the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever, and they shall reign forever and forever. Let's bow to God. Father, thank you for letting us know that you have prepared a place for us and this is where we will spend eternity if our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So Lord, open up this passage of Scripture and Father, may it just absolutely be marvelous. That would be so fantastic, so exciting that we'll be glad that we belong to you. For there's two eternities, one in the lake of fire with Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and all those who have not received Christ. And there's this new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth, an eternity for those who have. So Lord, may this challenge us, may it excite us, May it give us hope of a future with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing we want to look at here is the descent of the new Jerusalem. It says here in verse 1, there's a new heaven and a new earth. Now, it doesn't tell us anything about that new heaven and new earth because that's not the focus. The focus is going to be on this new Jerusalem. But I do want to go back and look at a couple of other things that others have said. Let's see what Peter has said. If you go back to 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, you know, we always talk about looking for the, the, the coming of Christ. Peter was looking for something else a little bit different. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, and let's begin reading here, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief. What's coming as a thief in the night? What is it? The day of the Lord. Now, what is that? So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. That's coming as a thief. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and listening for, for the coming of the day of the Lord, that's what he's looking for, of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements that will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look, this is what we're going to be looking for, for a new heaven and a new earth in which the righteous will dwell. And if you look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, this is what John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. So now we come to this 21st chapter, and we're going to go take a look at this eternal state. And nothing is said beyond there's a new heaven and a new earth, because the focus is going to be on this city, this new Jerusalem. So let's go look at it in verse 2. It's a holy city. It says that it comes down out of God from heaven, and it is described here as a bride who's adorned for her husband. So you have a double fulfillment of this city. There's a literal city where people are going to dwell, and there is the description of the church or the bride of Christ who's made herself ready. And this comes after the, the things that we've already looked at in terms of the marriage supper of the Lamb, coming back with him, and all of these things. Now, what's important here is that the focus is on the descent of this city. And with the descent of this city, we have some facts about God here in verses 3 and 4, and we have some statements from God in verses 5 through 8. Let's look at the facts about God here. First, the dwelling of God is going to be with man. Now, isn't this interesting? Because there's one time when God dwelled in the tabernacle, and then he dwelt in the temple, and the glory of God left the tabernacle, left the temple. And we see that it returned with Christ, and the Holy Spirit resided and remained and stayed upon him. And now God does not dwell in temples made with human hands. He dwells in us. 
Our spirit, which was dead towards God when we received Christ, comes alive. And so we now are the temple, the dwelling place of God. But there is a time coming here where this city is going to be the dwelling place of God, and God's going to live there, and we're going to live there with him. And notice this. He will wipe away every tear. When was the last time you shed a tear? What was it over? What was it about? Every tear is going to be wiped away. And notice, no more death. No more death. No more pain. No more mourning. No more sorrow. No more crying. Why? For the former things have passed away. That's because of the next statement that we begin to see from God in verse 5 and 8. He says, I'm making everything new. He is starting over. And everything, a new heaven, a new earth. But this focus I want you to see is this new Jerusalem. And he says to John, write this down, for it's true. I am who I said I am. I am going to fulfill all the promises that I've made. All of this is going to come true. And it is done. That is not a promise. That is a statement of fact. I am done. This is it. This is going to be from the beginning of creation. Now this is the end. I'm the Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letter in the Greek alphabet. I'm the beginning in Genesis. I'm the end here in Revelation. This is how things began. This is how it's all going to end. And he said, to him who is thirsty, I'm going to give of the water of life freely. We're going to take a look at that because there's a river here that's going to give life, and we're going to see that in a minute. He who overcomes is going to inherit. Folks, if you overcome and you walk into this city, you're going to inherit it all. I don't care what you're going to inherit in this life. You have the possibility as a believer in Christ of inheriting your place in this city. But notice who's outside, who will not be there. He lists them, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Can you imagine a culture, a society, without that in it? What that's going to be like? Why? Because their place has already been set aside. They've already been placed into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is eternal separation from God. So that's their place. But I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, and this city has been prepared for you. So let's go take a description. Let's go look at the description of this new Jerusalem. First, we have a tour that's described here, and I want us to take a look at that tour in verse 9. The guide for that tour is going to be one of the seven angels who had the, one of the seven last plagues. That's the tour guide. And the invitation for the tour is, come, I'm going to show you the bride. So not only is we're going to see a literal city, but we're going to be describing here the bride of Christ. By the way, how many of you here are part of the bride of Christ? If you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're, you are the bride. And God is making you ready in this life. He's going to give you a new resurrection body when he returns. And he's going to bring you into this beautiful place. But he's going to show him, first of all, the transportation for this tour is the Spirit, the Spirit of God. John is taken up by the Spirit of God, and he's taken to a location, and that location is a high mountain because God wants to give him the vista. He wants to give him the vantage point of this city descending from God out of heaven. And what's he going to tour? Not only the city, but the bride. This is going to be a description of us of the church as well as a description of a literal city. Now let's look at the appearance. Let's look at the appearance of this holy city in Jerusalem. It came down out of heaven from God. I want you to stop and think about because remember what Jesus promised in John 14? He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. See, in the Jewish culture, a young man would go out and, and, and the gal that he wanted to marry, he'd pour a cup of wine before her. If she took that cup, it meant that she would marry him. If she didn't drink the cup, he was a loser. <laughs> but if she drank the cup, he'd go back to his father's house, and he would add a room to his father's house. And that's the beautiful thing here. In my father's house are many rooms that I have prepared for you. This, this is going to be the greatest apartment complex, <laughs> high-rise, whatever you want to call it, you've ever seen. We're going to look at it in a minute. It's shown with the glory of God. I'm going to tell you how important that is, because when we see how thick the walls are, this, this is amazing. God's glory shines through it all. 
and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, jasper, clear as crystal. That's like a diamond in its color. Now, I want to focus in here because it had a high wall. I want you to notice this wall here. There was an, an angel of a gate. There's 12 gates on this city. And every gate had a name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I want you to understand, this is how the camp was set up in the Old Testament when they were in the wilderness. The tabernacle was set right in the middle of the camp. Then there are three tribes on, on the north, three tribes on the south, three tribes on the east, and three tribes on the west. Now, this was approximately, some say, it could have been 12 miles long on one side so, because each tribe had about two to three miles to spread out. But here's the important thing. Every tent in that camp faced towards the temple. First thing they saw when they woke up, the last thing they saw when, when they went to bed was the tabernacle. And what, what's going to be in the center of this is going to be God himself. But the wall has the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, Old Testament. Now the foundation, now this is interesting, because you've got you to picture this. The city is going to rest upon 12 foundations. The wall of the city is going to rest on 12 foundations. And the name of those are the 12 apostles. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church on the prophets and the apostles. So you have the blending of the Old Testament and New Testament. God's bringing them all together into one place, into one building. No more Jew, Gentile, bond free, male, female. We're all one in Christ, and we're all coming to this beautiful city laid upon the foundation of the apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. And look at the shape, guys. This, this, this blows you away. The size and the shape of this city. It says here, and if you look at verses 15 to 17, the shape, it's, he just begins to describe it as a square, then he describes it as a cube. It is as long as it is wide as it is high. Now, this is the amazing thing. It says the city is 12,000 stadia. That is 1,380 miles. That is approximately the distance between Chicago and Denver. Now, I want you to picture a city running this way, this way, and this way, 1,380 miles into the air and long and wide. Somebody has calculated, well, by the way, the, the wall is 144 cubits, and that's important later on. That's 72 yards. That's three-quarters of the size of a football field. That's how thick the wall is. Now, can you imagine how bright God's glory has to be to shine through that? Just stop and think about it. But now here's the thing. It's been calculated that if, if you filled up just a fourth of that space, just a fourth of that space of that city, you could house 20 billion people. There's only five and a half billion people on the face of the earth right now. So if you just fill it up a fourth of the way, you could have over 20 billion people in this space. Now look at the description of the wall here in verse 18. It's made of jasper. Now what's interesting here, jasper is, jasper is kind of like a, a, a diamond color. And if you look back at verse 11, God's glory is going to be able to shine through that 72 yards, I think I said feet, 72 yards of wall. That's how clear it is. Can you imagine anything clear in our culture today that you can have light shining and still see it 72 yards away? I mean, that's amazing. And the description of the city here is pure gold as pure glass. I want to tell you, the, the Crystal Cathedral has nothing to this. This is amazing. Now look at the description of the foundation. Now you've got you to picture this because God's colors move from foundation to foundation to foundation. And it's listed here. The bottom one is jasper. That's clear as crystal. That's like a diamond. Then you move to sapphire. That is transparent blue. Then chalcedony is a greenish blue. And then you have an emerald, which we know to be green. And then the sarnyx is a reddish white, almost a pink in color. Then the carnelian is a bright red. The carcelite is a golden color. The beryl is, uh, is a sea green. Topaz is yellow green. Cassifras, however that is, you say it better than I can, is apple green. And then jacinth is blue. And then the very, very last one is the amethyst, which is purple. I wish I had the colors of that and could just show you the rainbow's got nothing on this. This is an amazing foundation. And you think 12 foundations and then this beautiful golden crystal city sits on top of that foundation. 
Now, look at the street. Oh, excuse me, the gates. We've got to get the gates. The gates is found in verse 21. Twelve pearls. Now, I don't know how big that gate is, but when you've got 1,380 miles in one direction, that gate's got to be pretty good sized. And it's one pearl. Now, the description of the great street. There's a street that runs through this city, and it's pure gold like transparent glass. We've never seen anything like that. The description of the temple, there is no temple here. God doesn't make, doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands anymore. Why? Because God is there. Jesus is there. So in the midst of this city, literally as well as the church, now we're going to get back to the church in just a minute. God is the temple. The Holy Spirit is the temple. And the description of the light here in verse 23, the light is the glory of God. The Shekinah glory is returning to his dwelling place. And the lamp is the lamb. Remember he, he said, that, let your word be a light unto and, and my path, a lamp unto my feet. Jesus is the word. In John 1.1, 1, 1, I am the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word is with God. He's the lamp. And the nations will walk by its light. There's not going to be any sun. There's not going to be any moon. There's not going to be any stars. This is going to be so luminous that we can walk in it and be lit. Now, let's look at some other facts about this city just real quick. It says the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. This is probably the ones that were reigning Christ over thrones. I'm not sure for sure who that is. That could be who it is. But the gates are never shut. I don't know about you, but the... We used to, when I grew up, we never locked our doors, we never locked our cars, we never did anything like that. Today, you don't dare leave your house without locking it up. You lock up the church, you put alarm systems, you put all this security, ADT and all this stuff in our home. No need to shut the gates because there's nothing outside that's going to come inside to harm it. Glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it because when God starts, when God returns, when Jesus Christ returns and he starts the millennium, he's going to separate the, the sheep from the goat nations. And so it's the nations that really belong to God that you're going to see that be able to enter in here. And only, look at this, folks. Only those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life will be able to enter that city. So here's the thing you've got to understand. You will never enter that city. In fact, you will never even see this city unless your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Unless you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you'll never see it, let alone ever enter it. Now, I want us to stop and think about with all the stuff we're going through, all the places we might live, this is where I'm going to spend eternity. Because, see, I am that New Jerusalem, too. It isn't just a physical place. The church is a bound of 12 foundations, the 12 gates. He sees us as precious as this city. But notice here, because I, I want to end here by looking at the delights. I want to tell you, there are six delights we're going to enjoy in this city. I don't know where we are in there, but let's see if we can find the delights of this city. The first delight in verses 1 and 2 of verse 25 of chapter 22, excuse me, is the river. Guys, rivers haunt me. You know, the river runs through it and talks about, you know, I'm haunted by waters. I am haunted. I love fishing. I do not fish lakes. I control once in a while. But ever since I was about five, six years old, I love to fish at the river. So when I see there's a river here, I get excited. I get really excited. But notice here, this is unique because it, it flows with the water of life. That is true of us as a church, but it's also going to be true and symbolic here of this river that flows. You know where you see this river of life? When Jesus stood at the woman at the well, and he said, you drink this water, you're going to get thirsty again. But if you drink of the water which I give, out of your being will flow rivers of living water. I will give life, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. This water gives life. And it flows, notice where it comes from. The source is from God. He's the source of our life. It comes from the Lamb. He's the source of our life. And it flows down right in the middle 
of the great street of the city. That's the first delight. The second delight is the river. Oh, excuse me, the trees. I guess that was the first one. The trees. Now, that's interesting because it says here that, that, that located on each side of the river is a tree of life. You know the last time you saw the tree of life? You saw it back in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. And the tree of life was something that Adam and Eve could not eat. And I'll tell you why. Because there's another tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They ate it and they sinned. So if they would have ate of that tree of life, they would have died in eternal sin and separation from God. So God sent an angel in the garden, drove them out of the garden, so they would not eat of that tree of life. But here it is. Here in this new Jerusalem, the tree of life. And, and it bore 12 crops of fruit, yielding fruit in every kind. You know, I don't know. That doesn't mean I don't get steak. I don't know. But that bothers me if that's the case. But anyway, whatever. I'm, no, that's, that's not even funny for you. It was funny for me, but it's not funny for you. But the leaves are for the healing. This tree is going to bring healing and bring life. Now, you know, the other delight is no more curse. We all live under the curse. Men, we are working by the sweat of our brow uh, with the thorns and tilling the ground because of the curse. Women, you, you have pain in childbirth. But here's the other thing. You know how God created man and woman? He created them like this. But woman usurped her authority. She did not check out the man. The man capitulated his headship, so God put the woman like this under the man to protect her. That not, was not God's design. I want to tell you, in eternity, new heaven, it's going to be like this again. I guarantee you. So no more curse, women. <laughs> but you know what? It says creation. Right now, creation is groaning. You know, we have all these people talking about global warming and all this stuff and all this, and I understand, you know, I'm a conservationist and all that, but listen. This is when the creation will go back to what God intended, where the lion will lay down with the lamb, and the little child will not be afraid of putting its face into the serpent's hole. I mean, you go read it. All our instruments of war will be beaten into plowshares. All creation reverts back to what God intended it to be. So there's going to be other creation things around, yeah? Yeah, all the creation goes back. And notice the throne of God. It was in heaven, now it's here, in the city. And the servants will serve him. What are we going to do? We're going to serve God. Servants are going to see his face. And we're going to name his name written in our forehead. And then there's a light. That's, a, that's the fifth delight here no more night I'm kind of kind of miss that I like the moon I like the stars I like it but you know what it's not going to be necessary because the light from the lamp from the sun will not be needed the Lord God is going to give us our light finally the duration I love this in verse 5 this new Jerusalem will be forever and ever and ever no end. So there's only one of two eternal destinations that we have. Every man, every man, every born, every woman, every child, every person ever born on the face of the earth, and everyone who's alive today, and tomorrow, and next year, and ten years, the Lord tarries. We only have two destinations. One is the lake of fire, and I'll tell you who's there. Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, and all unbelievers. Then there's the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and new earth. And who's there? God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and everyone whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life who's come to faith in Jesus Christ. There is no holding ground. There's no middle ground. Your eternity will be one or the other. Now, here's the kicker. The decision in this life determines where you're going to spend all eternity. And if, if you're hearing the sound of my voice today and you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ, you know that Jesus is who he said he was, that he's the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive you of your sin, to provide you a relationship with God. If you've never accepted that free gift of forgiveness, your eternal destiny is already set. And if you were to die today, that's where you'll spend eternity. I'm not saying that to scare you. That's just a fact. Jesus said, it is done. There's going to come a day when there'll be no more opportunity, no more chance, 
This is the day of salvation. You've never made that decision. You need to make it today. And Christian, you don't take your ease in Zion. You don't retire. You don't give it up. You don't quit with the struggle and with, with the hard times of your faith. Because Revelation says, he who endures to the end, he who overcomes, will receive of the tree of life and this free water. I wish I could do this. and I wasn't going to do this, but, I, but I, I'm going to talk to you about it. We talked about it in class this morning. If I took a big sparkler, and I have one, I, if I had it, if I didn't play, be afraid of burning the place down, I would have brought it in here. But if you take a big sparkler, the fire source, you know, is the, the lighter, and that's Jesus Christ. You, you light your life to that sparkler. And then you take that sparkler, and you light somebody else's sparkler. Now the question is, somebody lit your sparkler sometime for you to come to faith in Christ. The question is, whose sparkler have you lit? Who is going to be following you into this new city? Let's bow together. Father, I want to thank you for this wonderful, beautiful book that we don't have to worry about where we're going to spend eternity, what's it going to look like, who's going to be there. You've given us the answer. And though we don't know all the details, and it's so overwhelming, we can't even hardly imagine it, but, Father, that's how you see us. When you look at me, you don't see Ed. You see Jesus Christ. And my life has been exchanged for his life. My sin has been covered by his blood. And my name's been written in the book of life. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you that we know who holds tomorrow. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he holds my hand and he leads me into this new city into eternity to be absent from the body is to be forever present with the Lord and that you prepared a place for us and you're coming again to receive us into yourself if there's anyone here Lord that's never never accepted that free gift of salvation that they would talk to somebody come to me and say I'm not sure I'm a Christian I'm not sure I'd have eternal life if I were to die I want to make sure of that and for those of us who've made that decision, may this challenge us to bring others to this city by bringing them to Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. You love Jesus? Yeah? Well, let's go ahead and stand and sing that. See, we love Jesus because he loved us first. All right, in the song we're going to sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. We're going to sing a lot, of, a lot about the things that Jesus has done. Dying on the cross, being our redeemer, redeemer, savior, wearing the crown of thorns. That was all out of love towards us. So as we sing this song, I pray that would be in our heart, that we would just show how much we love Jesus. Oh. 
Thank you for sacri sacrificing your life for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. I pray that you have a blessed week.